Thank you very much. Uh, welcome everyone to this uh, panel on how to protect journalists from political pressures. My name is Rasmus Nelson. I'm director of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford, and I'm be chairing this discussion today where we will sort of broadly go in the order uh, from sort of troubled countries to countries with a truly terrible situation uh, for press freedom. And I think we all understand and we are all here in this room today because we know that globally, I think we can say with certainty now, we face an escalating war on journalism, uh, ranging from uh, rhetorical attacks uh, in countries the tradition of liberal democracy and free speech, uh, where the phrase enemies of the people, of course, has been deployed by uh, President Trump, uh, to far more uh, direct and forceful uh, attempts to stifle or in some cases also kill journalists who displease or inconvenience uh, people in positions of power. Um, and I suppose that what we'll try to do at the um, uh, discussion today before we open it up for um, thoughts from everybody in the room is to think about you know, what can be done to protect uh, journalists from political pressures in different environments where, broadly speaking, these are all worse <laughs> than the ones we see in Western Europe uh, or, for that matter, Central and Eastern Europe. So every country represented on the panel here is ranked more lowly for press freedom than Hungary. Um, some of them far more lowly um, than Hungary, uh, which I think is quite a sobering uh, reminder for those of us who live in far more privileged parts of the world. Um, and again, we are interested here, I suppose, in the question of, um, you know, if we believe that however inspiring the individual heroism of journalists and editors like uh, Rana Ayub or Maria Ressa uh, or their uh, nameless but equally brave counterparts around the world who face these pressures every day in the thousands. I wear this scarf, which was a gift from a journalist fellow at the Reuters Institute who gave it to us, uh, to, to me, um, who faced these pressures in his country of origin too, and who's not a person who's on stage every day but faces this in a small provincial uh, city in his country of origin, so nameless heroes too. If we believe that individual heroism, however inspiring, is not an appropriate or sufficient response to institutional problems, what can we do to actually uh, help protect newsrooms and individual journalists from these pressures? Um, so I will just ask that question, I suppose. Um, and then we will start uh, with Daniela uh, Pinheiro, who is editor-in-chief of Epoca from Brazil, which uh, last year, Reporters Without Borders ranked 102nd out of 180 countries in the world in terms of press freedom. So, Daniela, do you want to share your thoughts first, and then we'll go down uh, the table. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, actually, in Brazil, you have um, a very democratic environment yet uh, for media, but uh, the fact that I am in the first step here in our line of, you know, countries in danger um, would be um, easier for me because I would have so much to learn from my colleagues here, but the problem is um, I have the impression that um, it's impossible uh, to learn uh, or it's impossible to, to not um, get into, uh, uh, into this, um, all this, the, the, the problems they, the, we all are facing and uh, I think it, uh, um, they will be worse somehow uh, and soon. Um, so my question is, um, that the question I, I debate with myself as a, uh, an editor-in-chief in, 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 in Brazil, where Bolsonaro, the new president, he, he, he's mimicking uh, Trump in everything, the worst things ever, like um, proclaiming, uh, celebrating media as the enemy of the people and, and saying that journalists are fake news. And, uh, and we have a problem in Brazil. There is a, the media there is a very, um, we have a very narrow um, environment. There are three, uh, only three uh, major media groups, and uh, mostly of them are very de dependent on uh, public resources um, uh, for advertising. I'm talking uh, about print, of course. And, uh, and the first thing Bolsonaro said uh, is, uh, during the campaign, for example, uh, was when he, if he gets there, he will, uh, you know, stop uh, giving 
media money. And he's doing that already. So the thing is, how can we protect our, our journalists from being attacked? Uh, and we are attacked uh, on social media uh, by the president and, for, and by their supporters. Um, I think one of the, 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 the important things to do is um, uh, our legal department in, uh, at the newsrooms are not prepared, I think, to deal with this new, with the, the new normal, you know. Um, during the elections, we, we published a cover of, um, about this Chen um, things, the websites that, that publish uh, uh, terrible things about other candidates and etc. And the day after we published this cover, um, the address of uh, the reporter, and the reporter was uh, an intern, was published in many social medias, and um, and I uh, and the guy he, he he's 21 years old, so he was des desperate, and his mother called me. It's, it's a weird, you know, situation where you need to to talk to 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 a reporter's mother. And when I I I, I talked to the, our legal department, they said no. Um, we need to wait and see if this, this thing will grow and, uh, and maybe if we do something now, it's enlightening something that maybe sh should be small. So I don't think it's the right um, ad, uh, you know, advice for our newsrooms, but I think uh, nobody knows how to do actually still. Um, yeah, I have other things about thoughts about that but I want to I would love to hear my thanks too. thanks to that. well I mean we'll return to hear your reflections on the observations from uh, other contexts so Bobby Gosh is uh, is currently a member of the editorial board of Bloomberg though I should hasten to add uh, that while there are many problems facing the press in the UK uh, of, of which one is to how to make sense of the senseless uh, you are not here uh, in your uh, capacity uh, as, as someone working in London but in part due to your past experience as editor-in-chief of the Hindustan Times uh, in India, which again, last year was rated 138 out of 180 countries in the world on press freedom. So, Bobby. Um, yes, um, I think, I, I don't want to pass the ball down uh, here, but I wish I had been on a part in a, in a panel like this three years ago before I accepted uh, the job at the Hindustan Times, because then I would have learned more from people sitting to my right um, and sort of taken some lessons with me uh, to India uh, that would have better prepared me for what I was going to uh, experience there. So the first piece of advice I would give you, and I, I think you've, you've already taken this into account, is don't be naive. Um, don't, don't depend on a history of democracy and democratic uh, principles and democratic tradition. Don't assume that just because a country and has had a, uh, a democratic tradition and a tradition of the free press that that is going to continue. <clears throat> um, my experience at the Hindustan Times um, showed me that I was, I was very naive. I, when I went to India, um, I was completely aware that uh, things were getting hard for journalists. Um, I was aware that the, the government uh, that had just been uh, that had just come into power had uh, different notions about uh, journalism than the ones that had gone before, but I had underestimated just how much uh, they were willing to do in order to get in the way of journalism uh, and, and I think the owners of the newspaper, the people who hired me uh, trying to bring some change, had also underestimated just how much uh, how little tolerance the government had. Uh, for any kind of criticism and dissent and how much they were willing to do. Um, one of the things that, that, is, that I think is in common with all the, the new hyper-nationalistic, populist, right-wing governments around the world is that they are both majoritarian and maximalist. Um, the maximalist piece is something that's often forgotten. Um, there was an expectation in India that, based on previous experience, uh, that the government would allow a certain amount of um, dissent or criticism in the elite English language papers. 
on the assumption that, well, the elite who read English language papers, A, either don't vote, or if they do vote, they're unlikely to vote for the BJP. Um, and so there was an expectation that they would, they would concentrate to the extent that they were interested in controlling the media, that they would try to control the local language press, which is far, which has a far greater reach and a much greater impact on voting behavior, and that they would leave the English press alone because we were too small to matter. Well, this government doesn't believe that. This government believes in maximal pressure across the board, every institution uh, on which they have leverage, they believe in exercising that leverage. And so that my number one lesson was uh, I had been too naive. I, I had uh, been uh, too complacent about India's tradition of, of a free press. Um, if I had had a chance to do things all over again, I would have, uh, I don't think I would have changed the journalism that we did, uh, but I would have had a clearer idea of what was to come. Um, and I would have anticipated some of the, the attacks that, uh, that we endured. I mean, we, the, the, the things, the challenges that we face are, are I, I would broadly put them in three categories. How to protect our journalists, first and foremost, the human beings who do the journalism. How to protect our journalism, so the work we do. And then the third thing is how to protect our journalistic institutions. So whether they're newspapers or magazines or, or television channels. And it starts with the question of how far is the government or the regime, depending uh, as the case may be, how far are they willing to go to stop you? Um, and the better your idea of how far they're willing to go is, the, the, the better prepared you will be for how to do these three things. Protect your journalists, protect your journalism, and protect your institutions. I don't want to hog the mic too much, and I'm sure we can, we, we'll sort of have an opportunity, Erasmus, to talk more about these three categories, but I want to, I'm, I'm very keen to hear what people to my right have to say. So speaking of people to your right, um, Safar Abbas, editor at Dawn, and in this particular uh, case, the uh, ranking of Pakistan and India are statistically um, uh, not, not sort of not very different. Pakistan is ranked 139th, so just adjacent to uh, to India in terms of uh, press freedom, uh, but perhaps um, less of a um, naivete about a tradition, if you will, than in the case of India. So, if you'll share your experience in Pakistan. Thank you. Well, the situation is definitely far worse in Pakistan uh, in terms of pressures, uh, but I don't know how these countries are categorized in terms of press freedom, uh, uh, I have never been impressed with the way they are treated because there are no real laws to curb uh, press freedom in the country. Uh, it's very different from what it used to be in, in the 80s uh, when I started journalism. In fact, right in 1980, uh, when there was military rule, there used to be direct censorship. Uh, and one of my duties at that time as a cub reporter was uh, once a week to take the physical copy of the newspaper to the censor office where the censor officer, a semi-literate person, used to go through uh, the newspaper and used to pull out stories that this cannot go and this cannot go. To an extent, not just stories commenting about the military rule or the political activities of people who were in power, but even crime stories and their logic was you cannot uh, go with so many crimes story because it gives an impression that uh, under a military rule there are so many crimes going on in the country. So if uh, that was the situation, over a period of time, a military regime went away, uh, democratic governments came in, and gradually, because of the power of the trade unions and journalist unions, we did win a kind of freedom. Now. New tactics have come in, and that is, instead of breaking in the laws, use all kinds of pressures, right from restricting advertising to a publication you don't like or a television channel you don't like, to pressurizing reporters, pressurizing editors, pressurizing owners. Uh, to illustrate the point, in the last 15 years, there has been a mushrooming of media houses in Pakistan from one television channel, now we have got more than 30 24-7 news channels in the country. Uh, the irony is that as, as the media landscape has 
become much bigger, people who are not in love with this profession have stepped in. Pe people with many other industries and businesses, and uh, so they are the ones who are the, now the real people who are calling the shots in, in, in the uh, media uh, cir circles over there. And for them, even if a newspaper is in loss or the television company is not making money, is of little importance as long as they can use it as, as a lever to promote their other businesses. Uh, and that is where the real pressure on professional journalists or professional media organization that have traditionally been there in the field is coming on. What the hell is wrong with you people? That if those people are falling in line, listening to requests, pressures, uh, complaints, and other things, why are you still resisting? Uh, and the whole idea is to throw them out uh, from the media, just deal with people you can handle because of their own other interest. You can handle them. You can you can use your pressure. Even the request with them works to promote the prime minister. In fact, in Pakistan, there are two strands of uh, uh, pressures that come on on the media. One comes from the government of the day. The other from the military. Uh, the, Pakistan has a history of military's involvement in politics. Uh, uh, for half of its existence, the, there has been military rule in the country, and they have a foothold on many things in po uh, politics, and they don't want media to highlight the, the, their involvement. Same is the case with most governments, uh, even they are civilians, they come through democratic channels, but they do not like criticism in, uh, in the media. The thing that makes a difference and that keeps us going is, depends on how independent and strong the editor is there who's running the newspaper or television channel, and to what extent the publisher or the owner of that company is providing you the support. If the support from the publisher is there and the editor is independent-minded, uh, you can still take on that pressure. The pressure may come on the reporter, the pressure may come on the journalist who's on the ground, but if the editor is backing you and the management is backing the editor, you can still continue to do the kind of journalism that is needed. Yes, of course, there is a price. Uh, for instance, in my own newspaper, for the last three years, there have been zero advertising from the businesses that are run by the military. Uh, there is almost negligible advertising coming to the newspaper uh, from uh, government sections. And at times, even the private businesses, they look up to what the mood of the authorities are. If they are not advertising the newspaper, they too become reluctant to advertise because they don't want to annoy the authorities uh, over there. So those pressures are there. Uh, if you can resist those pressures, if you can take the public on your side, probably there is hope that independent journalism may survive or may survive for a few few more years. In the, otherwise, otherwise, these pressures are going to prevail upon and they are going to destroy honest, independent, and free journalism in countries like Pakistan, India, and elsewhere. Thanks very much, uh, Zafar. A sobering uh, picture, and I suspect that things might get even incrementally somewhat more uh, sobering as we turn to Lina Atala, who's publisher of Madam Asar in Egypt, which is, uh, uh, as sad as it is, uh, at the bottom of the rankings, however imperfect they are in terms of the countries represented at the table today at uh, 160 first uh, out of 180 countries uh, on that list. Lina. Okay. Um, uh, it's not so nice to... It's working. It's fine. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not so nice to be that kind of special, but anyways, um, it's, um, so, I mean, it's no surprise uh, to also um, say that in the last uh, five years, five and a half years, uh, we've seen uh, a major decline in, uh, you know, the general environment of civil and political liberties in Egypt, uh, but it's been particularly marked by uh, the mobilization uh, of 
state institutions to serve the current authorities in way in ways that I haven't uh, seen before, even um, in pre-revolutionary times. So um, it is a time where we, we are seeing constitutions being changed uh, to give uh, indefinite powers to those who are already in power, um, major legislation uh, restricting uh, press freedoms. Um, and that's on the formal level, of course, on um, the other side of the spectrum, uh, we are seeing many uh, journalists alongside political activists uh, being uh, thrown in jail, um, either in you know ongoing pretrial detention uh, or actual prosecution that have um, sent um, some journalists with um, sentences as grave as death sentences that were appealed later on, but uh, this is the level um, we have uh, we have reached. And you know, besides that, um, we also have seen um, in the last five years uh, an unprecedented direct acquisition by security apparatuses of uh, most media out there. Um, and those who are left uh, alone are under close scrutiny, so the choice has been self-censorship. Uh, in a lot of the cases, uh, but also uh, without much of a choice because, um, you know, um, I, and I told this anecdote uh, in another panel, um, we are in a situation where uh, many of the chief editors that are left there that are not under the direct ownership of the security apparatuses are receiving daily WhatsApp uh, messages uh, from uh, people in, in, in security apparatuses telling them how they should cover certain stories or how they shouldn't cover certain stories. So, for example, there was um, a major directive that the protests in Sudan should be completely ignored. Uh, same thing with Algeria. These are obviously the kind of things that uh, make our governments quite uh, nervous. So how, how to go about working in an environment uh, like that? Um, so I work in an independent media. There aren't uh, many of us out there. Um, we kind of work in a silo, uh, uh, luckily or unluckily, I don't know. We're not one of the people who receive the WhatsApp messages. Uh, so, um, and the investment um, in, in, in trying to keep doing what we're doing has been centered on a few things. Uh, first, you know, using the fact that we've built uh, an institution um, with a certain level of collectivity um, has been a major, um, a major um, sort of uh, tool of mitigating the risks in the sense that um, I don't, I'm the chief editor, but I don't take decisions on my own when it comes to major risks. Uh, to give you an example, uh, our website has been blocked um, uh, two years ago alongside over 500 uh, websites in Egypt. Um, and most of them are media websites. Um, and um, we are one of two media that decided basically to go to court to contest uh, the decision uh, of the authorities to, to block our website. Uh, we went to court, uh, we brought the regulator, the comms, uh, the telecoms regulator uh, to court and uh, the representative basically said, I have nothing to do with this, ask the sovereign security apparatuses for it. Um, our lawyer came back and said, the only option you've got is to basically sue uh, the intelligence services. Do you really want to do that? And we've said, well, if we don't fight this fight, who else will fight it on behalf of us? Um, it sounds like a fantastic decision to like, go and brag about, but I think the moving thing for me is when we uh, basically convened the meeting with all the journalists and said, you know, would you be ready with, for this kind of confrontation? Would you be ready to continue working under, um, under this, this, uh, this circumstance, basically? And they said yes. Um, um, and it was moving in the sense that, um, you know, there were, like we strengthen each other by being together. And I feel that this has been a major strategy to, by the authorities to basically dismantle collectives and groups and, you know, force people to think that it's not possible anymore to work as a collective. And that's exactly what I insist on to continue working as a collective. Another thing we've been investing on so much and the crisis has helped us in it uh, in some way is to basically insist on building constituencies, insist on building a community around what we do. Um, it's not a major leverage, but it's a good thing to say that people need us, people will feel very sad the moment this website is gonna be completely gone. 
Um, and it's something that we that is in the DNA of how we work in terms of, you know, how we disseminate the content, but also how we organize, um, you know, events and convene um, groups of people around the work we do. Uh, it's basically feeding the sense of we are essential, uh, and it's not very difficult to feed it in light of the fact that there aren't any voices out there anymore. Um, there is a major deficit in uh, the information flow in the country right now, and I feel that uh, we are one of the very few left out there to create a record for these very difficult days in the life of the of the country. Um, you know, we were we are much more aware, especially in the last couple of years, of questions of well-being and uh, things that can be done. Um, in institutions to, you know, become ecologies of care, uh, to become kinder to, to journalists working under such circumstances. So that's another thing um, we've been working and thinking on uh, in terms of policies, in terms of, uh, in terms of you know, different uh, privileges that we've tried to, you know, give to people working with us. So, so that's another um, important thing. And the last thing I'll say is that um, I know it's very easy to come off as super brave and, and, and so on, but our work also consists of a lot of negotiating, uh, negotiating on the level of everyday practice, you know, how, how am I going to run this, this headline in order to, you know, make it pass and not to, you know, kill the, what we're trying to do in a day. Um, a lot of the times, there are super interesting uh, mini scoops or scoops that come, our, that come our way. And, you know, sometimes it's so, it would be so nice to just go ahead and publish them and, you know, they, they, they are, you know, uh, they break major stories, but they are not corrobor corroborated enough. They haven't passed through uh, the standard checks of, uh, of you know evidence and so on. So you know we we are not just um, kids who are confrontational. We negotiate a lot on a day-to-day -day basis, and we do it together. And I think it provides us with uh, another measure of protection. And I'm sorry. The last last thing I'll say is uh, we are also very conscious of our privilege. As you know, in the end of the day, we we tend to come from a certain middle class elite. I'm the kind of person who gets access to these kinds of conferences. And that's, there's a leverage in there that we are aware of. Um, there it's, we invest in it, we are not, uh, we, we, we're not ashamed of it, but it's perhaps also um, um, a measure of protection for us that wouldn't be affordable to other people um, not having that kind of privilege, so. Thanks very much, Lena. I mean, I think in some ways we can already begin to identify a couple of themes that have come out that might be useful for others either in the room or, or people on the panel. So just a couple of things that stand out for me from what people are sharing here. I think, you know, Lena, you identify solidarity uh, internally in the organization, in the newsroom and news organization, but also in Safar's so example from the period of military rule across a profession. Right, of, of organizations um, standing together. You know, Bobby and I have talked in the past about that remarkable incident a couple of years ago that some of you will remember where the Obama White House was denying Fox News access to interviews with uh, the president and the other TV networks refused to interview the president unless Fox was given access, including uh, networks like MSNBC that, that has no ideological overlap or no shared principles really with Fox, apart from sort of perhaps some basic belief in Newtonian geometry or something like that. Uh, and, and even then, they sort of stood together uh, obviously in a very different context, but the, uh, I think the power of solidarity, I think, is an interesting observation from, from what people have shared of how they try to negotiate, as, as Nina says, at these difficult situations. I think ownership is another uh, interesting one, right? The sort of the question of how vulnerable um, the ultimate owner and beneficiary of a given news organization is to sort of the, the full range of tools at the disposal of a government that wishes to curtail uh, press freedom. Uh, ranging from uh, examination of tax affairs or selective enforcement of regulations uh, in, in other adjacent industries or state contracts or the like. So ownership, I think, is an interesting dimension here. And of course, we don't get to choose our owners, um, but it is worth thinking about what is sort of the larger configuration that a particular news organization is, is part of. Um, I was also struck by um, Zafar's observation about the sort of selective withdrawal of advertising and I suppose that um, uh, those who are sort of thinking about how to future-proof 
there are news organizations about for sort of potential worst times to come. The sort of the question of how much of your advertising are you in a position to walk away from is a, is a quite an important uh, question. No one wants to leave money on the table, but are you in a position where there are sums of money you can't live without? Uh, I think it's also a, a clear one. I think it goes back in some ways also then to Lena's point about building a community. I mean, ultimately, if you are primarily um, based on your readers, um, of course, that, that model too is vulnerable to all sorts of pressures um, or, or other issues and whatnot, but at least that direct source of revenue is not one that some um, elected official or government bureaucrat can sort of uh, remove from one day to another without resorting to rather more draconian means uh, than what people have um, described here. Um, I suppose, uh, Danielle, it might be interesting to return to you after what people have said, uh, to sort of how you, how you look at the experiences others have shared um, and sort of reflect on your own situation in Brazil going forward. Yeah, <clears throat> when you were uh, talking about uh, solidarity, um, it came to my mind um, what Colombia did during their turbulent times with the traffic, the drug traffic and everything. When in Medellin, for example, uh, if you publish something, uh, a, 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 a piece that, uh, you know, the guys, of, they uh, didn't like it, they killed you. And then they decided to collaborate, all the major newspapers in Colombia, they decided to publish a, the same piece mm. in the same day with no signature. So they could do this, this uh, you know, channel of collaboration was a ve a very, very interesting and they, they could, uh, uh, you know, reveal many things and uh, came up with uh, the, the, this really compelling um, stories uh, about uh, the, 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 the drug kings uh, over there. But I, I was thinking about if is it possible to do this in Brazil, because as I told you, it's a very narrow um, environment in a way of uh, the, the, the legacy media. We have like three major newspapers, two at, uh, basically, two in, uh, three, two in Sao Paulo and one in Rio, in a country of 200 million you know, citizens. It's, it's ridiculous. It's, uh, and they belong to family groups, who, who are in the business for decades. And um, I remember recently uh, a senator who, who is not with uh, aligned to, to Bolsonaro, but he published um, a Twitter uh, saying one of uh, the most well-known journalists in Brazil, she, she had an affair with a politician and he called her whatever, terrible things, so vulgar. And I called, um, uh, the editor-in-chief of Veja, who is my first competitor in, uh, in our market, and, uh, and he used to be my boss. This is funny. And I told him, why don't we, we do something together? I mean, let's um, write an article uh, in, in four hands saying how outrageous this guy were, was and blah, 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 and, and we can publish it both in Veja, the, the most, the, 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 the largest leading uh, uh, weekly magazine in Brazil, and then we should ban this, the, the name of this, this man for like a month in our articles. And it would be a very innovative thing, right? And he thought, oh, Danielle, it's a nice, great idea, but no because we are competitors and I can't foresee doing something. But it was in pro of a friend of us. Mm. Um, and, I, uh, and comparing this initiative um, to a broader thing, like broader uh, thing as like, let's, you know, uh, face Bolsonaro together and trying to build someone together. I don't, I don't think there is room for that yet. Um, and the, the thing is, of ownership is very, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem. This very narrow market, very restricted, restricted um, people, um, you know, in charge of this thing. I mean, I suppose in the sort of the conventional history writing about the development of journalism in the Western world, the idea was that as news organizations grew larger and more profitable, they were more able to withstand political pressures. 
Um, and there could be some truth to that historically, but of course there's a flip side of that, which is that they also become more vulnerable yeah. to other kinds of pressures that historically haven't been exercised in the United States or in Western Europe, but are very much being exercised, clearly in several of the countries well, that the, the table the, here. The, the, the lesson, one of the lessons from India is that the, the, the dependence on advertising, the, the flip side of that is the, the fact that newspapers are so cheap. In India, your, your monthly subscription to a newspaper is literally the smallest bill that you will pay every month. It's cheaper than water. It's cheaper than milk. It's cheaper than bread. Um, and, and for two generations, people have, newspapers have gotten away with it because they had advertising. And uh, they were living in, in, if you like, in a fool's paradise, thinking that the government would every government would continue to give them, essentially subsidize their business without expecting a pound of flesh in return. Um, in, in the Hindustan Times in, in New Delhi, I think five rupees, five and a half rupees on the newsstand, that is less than the price of one single stick of cigarette. Not a packet, one cigarette uh, of a mid-priced cigarette in India. So if your newspaper is worth less than one stick of cigarette, then there is something fundamentally wrong with your business model. In India, over the last 20 years, the Indian, India's economy has grown dramatically. It's a, it's a great story of how India has raised 300 million people into its middle class. The price of everything in India has gone up two, three, four times. Uh, water, uh, everything, except the price of newspapers. That's not a sustainable business model. In the United States, no major newspaper depends on government advertising. I don't know enough about the history of, of the media, uh, the print media in, in the United States. I don't know if there was ever a time when American newspapers needed government advertising in order to survive. But if they did, it's been a long time since they weaned away from that. But the flip side of it is, if, if Indian publishers are willing to charge more for their product, if they are willing to have faith in their journalism and say our journalism is worth more money than people are currently paying for it. The flip side of that is you have to accept that you cannot sell as many papers. So the Hindustan Times sells a million and a quarter newspapers uh, at five rupees. If the price were to go up to 10 rupees, some proportion of that, I don't know how many, but some proportion of that number of those subscribers will stop buying the paper. Um, but if you want to, to, to wean yourself away from government advertising, owners are, are going to have to make that call and make that choice, just as American owners at some point in their history had to make that cho choice. I mean, maybe uh, um, there are lots of things we could tear into, but I also want to make sure people have a chance to, to offer thoughts from the, um, from, the, from the floor. But there's one point that's very interesting to me that hasn't come up in this discussion so far that I'd love to hear any thoughts that people have on, which is the question of... Um, what, if anything, do you believe that social media companies can or should do to protect journalism from political pressures? And I think the backdrop here that's worth keeping in mind is that there's been a lot of both urgent uh, and necessary critical discussions of social media companies at this festival, as there should be. But I think it's also interesting to just remember that there is the backdrop of the idea that companies like Facebook and Google in some way should be committed to what's called the Ruggy principles uh, of um, business and human rights, and that corporations have a responsibility to respect human rights above and beyond what the l national legal envir environment may uh, allow or require. And I just wonder whether any of you have any thoughts on what, if anything, you think companies like Facebook and Google can or should do in this space, or whether you think they are just irrelevant in a discussion like this. Well, they are definitely not irrelevant. Uh, but contrary to what you have suggested or the expectations are, just the opposite is happening at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, it has happened with the way very organized vilification campaigns have been launched on social media platforms against journalists who try to do good journalism exposing wrongdoings of the government or the intelligence agencies and other and the way the trolling was used or has been used or is being used it's been phenomenal They're vicious campaigns against journalists just to give you one example almost two and a half years ago 
when Dawn, uh, one of the top journalists in Dawn, uh, my colleague Suril Almeida, published a story of discussion, a closed doors discussion because the, the then government and the intelligence agency basically discussing where the intelligence agencies have consciously or otherwise failed to go after Islamist militants in the country. Uh, the moment that the story was published, there was a major campaign. One was at the official level condemning the newspaper, uh, describing its uh, decision to publish the st story as anti-national and unpatriotic. Uh, intelligence agencies of four intelligence agencies were involved to hold inquiry how the information was leaked. Uh, uh, I appeared before the tribunal, my colleague Cyril Almeida, who did this story, he appeared before the tribunal. Of course, we refused to divulge the information and the sources. And then the campaign started, not just against the newspaper or the editor, but mainly against the, uh, the, uh, the writer of the story. And till this day, that campaign is there accusing them of being Indian agent, agent of the West, working for CIA, uh, and working against the state of Pakistan. And it was just about a discussion uh, between uh, the government and the intelligence agencies of how uh, we have so far failed to go after all the Islamic extremists in the, in the country. What I'm trying to say is that social media is being used by the authorities, the government, the political parties, just to go after journalists and media houses who they do not like and who they want to silence or discredit in the eyes of, of the people. And that is where the role of these major social media platforms come in. They either probably we have failed to make them realize that where they are failing uh, in, in doing their duty of uh, upholding the fundamental rights and trying to block these, the, this hate material on, the, on their platforms and uh, this, these vilification campaigns. Uh, we have tried to collaborate in other areas where direct physical threats against journalists have come in. For instance, uh, I work uh, with a forum called Editors for Safety in Pakistan, where our, our motto is that attack on one is attack on all. Uh, so whether a small time journalist belonging to a very small newspaper is physically attacked or somebody from my paper uh, is attacked or from a television company, we all take a united position on, the, on that issue. Uh, news is plastered all over television. Every newspaper is going to co uh, cover that story. But what we are thinking of doing now is expand this operation to try and convince all the editors that the kind of campaigns that are carried out uh, by these unnamed sources against journalists on social media should also be categorized as a serious safety issue. Hmm. And uh, it should be not only considered as hate material, but material which not uh, present journalists as a very vulnerable uh, commodity, you go out on the street and people will say, here is a journalist where everyone on Facebook or YouTube or uh, WhatsApp is calling anti-state, so he must have done something against the state, uh, uh, so he should be treated like that. And this is really creating a very dangerous situation in, in the country. So this is where these major social media platforms have to be realized that they have to do something, they cannot allow this kind of hate material, these kind of campaigns against journalists or human rights activists in countries like Pakistan, Egypt, India, and elsewhere. And unless they play their major role, this danger will remain. Lena, your experiences with this, and then I think we should open it up so people have a chance to chip in. Sure. Um, I you know, I don't have any expectations from, um, from these corporations because they are corporations, so, you know, there are priorities, and a lot of the times um, the, the, their priorities, you know, 
do not go hand in hand with uh, protection needs. Uh, we've had evidence, for example, we've had the worst evidence, for example, in the past years that IP data ha has been divulged about certain users by Facebook to our government in order to uh, track suspects of armed militancy, for example. So, you know, and we're talking here about the worst. Um, what we do as media is that we understand that these platforms are platforms that have power, and we just, pragmatically speaking, tap into that power. So ever since we've been blocked, we've used heavily Facebook to disseminate our content, especially in the first month before we could basically mount our own tools um, to circumvent the, the, the blocking and the, and the censorship and uh, be able to be back on our website. Uh, but in the meantime, we heavily used Facebook. Uh, you know, if we would wish something from Facebook is not necessarily protection, but not to necessarily also keep closing up the algorithms uh, that make our content more and more invisible from um, people's uh, streams. And you know, that's the most that I would hope for, and that's perhaps too much to ask because at the end of the day, it's business. So, yeah. I would add something, because um, every session we had, I, I attend here, for, for example, um, ended up with a huge criticism to Facebook and WhatsApp, and it's incredible uh, how bad press they, they have. <laughs> but the thing is, until uh, those, these corporations, if they um, um, have this idea of this denial mode on that they are not, they are not also uh, a media company. And I think they are, because when they, they said, oh, well, we, we are not a media company, so something it's, uh, that you don't have any, I don't, we don't have any responsibility for that. WhatsApp in Brazil was crucial for a Bolsonaro uh, election. They boost like, they, 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 it, there was agencies, uh, paid for boosting like three millions of messages for uh, for 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 citizens uh, uh, spreading fake news and misinformation. So the problem is, if and I don't see them trying to you know change their minds, open their minds and have and get this responsibility of being also an, a media agent. I think um, there's no point. It's pointless. On that happy note, um, we should open it up. I have furiously scribbled down my wish list. The next time I'm summoned to Menlo Park to tell Mark Zuckerberg how to run his company, <laughs> I shall tell him exactly how to do it. Uh, please, let's, uh, let's have some questions and comments. Please tell us who you are, unless you have good reasons to want to remain anonymous, which we would, of course, understand and respect, and ideally direct uh, something that should end with a question mark to one of the panelists. Uh, so please. Hi, everyone. I'm Murilo from Brazil. I have a question to, for Bobby. Uh, you mentioned the importance of not being naive about the, the risks for the traditional democracies. So it, so it sounds very disturbing for me as a Brazilian journalist. So I would like to know from you, uh, in your opinion, what the media uh, can effectively do in order to protect our democracy and avoid uh, damages in the pillars of our democracy. Well, I, I think that is asking quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of, uh, of uh, media, and certainly that's asking quite a lot of any one tel television station or one newspaper. Um, our mission has not changed. Um, the media through which we can uh, carry out our missions have actually increased, but the threats against us have increased by a larger factor than than our uh, own strength. Um, so we, we can't be naive about that. We have to recognize that. We have to be smarter about how we take on the, um, the forces that are ranged against us. Um, we can't simply run like Don Quixote into the, into the windmills and expect that we will come out unscathed. Um, like I said, we have to be much more conscious about the threats. We have to be careful about protecting our journalists. And that, what that means varies from place to place. Uh, and circumstance to circumstance. So, you know, if I have a if I have a reporter uh, working on a on a story that I believe will lead to physical threats against him or her, um, I should be willing to give them. I should be able to first of all make it clear to them before they start on the story that is the risk they are taking. 
which is what uh, Lena was talking about. Secondly, I should be prepared to give them the physical protection if necessary, uh, you know, guards. Uh, I should be ready to get them out of the, the country or the city or to, to a place where they will be safe if it comes to that. Um, I should be prepared to draw international attention. One of the, one of the things I think one of the, one of the um, techniques we have is to make ourselves porcupines, to, to make ourselves difficult to, to, to chew. You understand? We, we're, and, and one way to do that is draw international attention to the work we are doing. Now, um, I, I hope you, all of you have had an opportunity to listen to Rana Ayub, um, who's been on a number of different panels here. Um, I think what Rana is doing as a journalist in India is incredibly important, but I think what Rana is doing here is very important to her work in, in India, because by making herself a kind of canary in a coal mine by making herself well known to an international community of journalists, she's raising the cost um, of doing harm to her. If the government of an, if a, or one arm of the government or the government as a whole or an institution decides to go against Rana Ayub, they must know that they are taking on a world of opinion that will, that will uh, react to any harm that might be done to Rana, heaven forbid. So that's very important, that's a, that's a form of protection. You have to make yourself a porcupine so that if they come after you, uh, they, that they, will, they know that they will, there's a risk of them hurting themselves. Now, there are governments that are willing to do that. There are governments that don't care what the world thinks about them. 